We had the privilege this morning to um, be able to hear from uh, Candy and, and Stephen as they shared with us not just about the SING conference that they attended um, in Nashville, Tennessee, but more or less about worship. And uh, you'll hear in just a moment that uh, we're at a place as a church body uh, where the Lord is lining up everything perfectly and for His will and for His sovereignty. And we've just come off a of nine, nine weeks studying and in God's Word on how to, how to look at worship and, and the importance of, of uh, let's say, reformed congregational singing or a resurgence in congregation singing or a reformation in congregational singing. I believe this is something that needs to be recaptured in our local churches. A recapturing of God's people singing and, and really turning their intention on, on what does worship mean? What is true worship? And how does one worship the Lord? Is it head knowledge? Is it just knowing the words in a particular hymn? Or is it, or is it more intentional? Is it come from an overflow? And so as um, Stephen and Candy comes to share with us, I want to pray for them before they do, but I also want to encourage you uh, to listen intently and take it in, soak it in. Uh, Candy and Stephen has meant uh, a lot to this church body and to our family, and, and I know that you'll get a lot out of what they have to say this morning, so I pray that we'll take notes where we need to take notes and pray for the leadership of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will speak to you as they share. So I'm going to pray for you guys, and you and your family will come uh, in, in a moment to share with us uh, what the Lord has put on your heart and on your mind to share with the, the people at Piney Grove. So let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, thank you again for this opportunity uh, where, we, um, where we have uh, come to reflect on your word. We have reflected on who you are already. As we sang, Jesus is, is Lord of all, and as we reflected on the great power of Jesus' name, and I pray today that as we transition in this time of, of hearing your word and the importance of worship, the importance of singing, the importance of letting uh, the songs that we sing that are rich with scripture and theologically rich to wash over us, I pray, God, that we would be attentive to uh, what is said and that we would also be attentive and responsive to the Holy Spirit today. I pray for Stephen. I pray for Candy as they, as they uh, share with us and teach, uh, teach through their experience uh, this morning. I pray that you would give them guidance, uh, guide their hearts and their minds, give them the, the exact words they need to say. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys come share. Stephen's going to let me kick off the time tonight, tonight, today. Um, so this all started last May. Stephen gave me this gift for my birthday of tickets to go to the SING conference, which they'd only had one conference before, and as soon as I found out about that conference, it was like that would be a dream come true, but I never thought it would happen to get to go. So it was a trip in Nashville um, with internationally renowned speakers. Um, we, we, you would recognize some of the names. Um, David Platt was there who, I don't know if he's transitioned from presidency of the International Mission Board yet or not, but he, he was the president of the International Mission Board. He was there. Um, J.D. Greer, who's the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, spoke, but we missed him because we had to come home because of Hurricane Florence, but he was there. J.I. Packer, who's like 93, he was not there, but they videoed, I think they said they got 20 hours worth of an interview with him. They were just hoping to get a few minutes <laughs> of him talking about the Psalms and worship, and he spoke for 20 hours at 93 years old. <laughs> so that was really cool to hear from him. Um, about 80 countries were represented at this conference. They give scholarships to internationals. Um, who are from countries where there are not many Christians and they want them to see 
worship as a whole and learn and grow in how to lead worship in their home countries. Um, there were all generations there. Um, we saw children with their parents to, there was a lady in the choir who was probably 90 years old and she was the most joyful thing. I mean, she was probably like five foot tall and precious and adorable and just loved to sing praises to Jesus. Um, there were 7,000 people. The stage was in the center with people all around. So just imagine singing it is well with my soul with that many people how beautiful and invigorating that would be so it was an awesome gift um, I had always wanted to hear John Piper he's my favorite pastor other than you Larry of course and um, John Piper's like I listen to him all the time I, I gain a lot of wisdom from listening to his his talks and sermons and I was in the choir, which was an awesome experience, but the choir was behind the stage, so I did not even get to see his physical body. <laughs> but I got to see him on the screen, and I knew he was there, so that was cool. Um, but it was a great experience, and the Gettys, um, they're from Ireland, and they have created this initiative to reinvigorate people's to reinvigorate worship in the American church and beyond. Um, definitely, they're going beyond. Um, it blows my mind, Kristen Getty's three days younger than me, and I'm thinking how much she has accomplished in that amount of time. But they, um, they have three other conferences in the future um, that are gonna be focused on singing the life of Christ, singing the scriptures, and singing through the ages. This one was focused on singing on the Psalms, and it was, um, they had a lot of Anglican influences there. Um, the, and which was cool. I mean, we, we chanted back and forth. We read psalms back and forth to each other. And it was a good way for you to see there's not one way to do it, that you can worship in different ways, and it's okay. So we really enjoyed that. Um, going into this conference, I was expecting to get really practical to-do list of, okay, if we try this, it's going to reinvigorate everything here. And I did not get to do, well, that wasn't the number one thing I took away from this. It was not a to-do list. I did learn a lot of good things, of practical things we can try, but really what God did in my heart through this was reinvigorate my desire for worship in my own heart, which will hopefully overflow to the church. So the first major point that I took home was that authentic worship can't be anything created. Um, we, it's not about having the right instruments or perfect harmony, sound machines or lights. Authentic worship can only overflow from a heart that loves God and meditates on his word. So that's where it starts. I, wanna, I want us to turn to Psalm 103, um, if you have your Bibles. Psalm 103, and I'm going to read the whole thing. It's a great psalm. Now I have way too many favorite psalms as I've been preparing for this. <laughs> um, okay, Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not dwell with us a deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place is known no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to his 
to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his host, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So John MacArthur spoke on this psalm and really brought it to new life for me. Um, he basically says that it starts off with the psalmist trying to awaken his soul. He's speaking to his own soul and he's saying, wake up soul and bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And he keeps repeating that to himself so that he'll wake himself up to worship the Lord. And that then moves to him internally thinking about all that God has done for him. He, he goes into this list. He says, let us not forget all his benefits. And then he starts listing the benefits of God. He says he forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases, redeems your life from the pit. He's, right, he's righteous. He's merciful. He's gracious. His love abounds. His love is steadfast. He goes on and on and on. And that creates an overflow for him. He then not only says, wake up my soul and worship, he says, all you angels worship. All you hosts, stars, everything, wake up and worship God. And that's what he's saying in this psalm. So I'm not looking at my notes, so let me look at my notes. I just get excited. Um, so the writer is not asking God for anything here. He's not bringing any complaint to God, as many of the psalms do. It's just strictly pure worship. Um, let's see. And it begins and it ends with that personal call, bless the Lord, O my soul. Um, this is where MacArthur says all true worship begins in the heart, in the soul's contemplation of what it means to belong to God. As we contemplate our belonging to him, the sheer joy, the delight, love, and gratitude to God cannot be repressed and will overflow into outward worship. Has your soul meditated recently on all that the Lord has done for you? the benefits of your salvation, how he has forgiven your sins, he's redeemed you from hell, he's loved you, he's shown you mercy. We could go on and on and on, but has your soul reflected on that recently? We must awaken our souls from inaction and indifference. We must shout to our souls, bless the Lord, to wake them out of spiritual lethargy. We come to church on Sunday morning to reorient ourselves to reality. God is the ultimate reality, and nothing but what we do in his name and for his kingdom matters. That's all that matters, is his kingdom and making him known. We come here today to remind ourselves of that. It's out of the fullness of the heart that the mouth will sing. The most important thing we can do is grow in our personal walk with God through knowledge of his word and in prayer if we want to have a healthier worship life. This lesson washed over me one night as we were singing a song called All I Have is Christ. And Stephen, that's another song that meant a lot to Stephen as well. And we were talking about just sharing the words and we were like, you know what, let's just sing it because we love it. So I'm going to invite Stephen up and we're going to sing this song, All I Have in Christ. And the words are on the screen. They're beautiful words that just show a picture of where we were, how God saved us, and now our life is just sold out for him. So...
I can't follow the music, I can't hear it good. Let's just sing. But as I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is my is my life. Now, Lord, I would be yours alone and live so all might see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose and let my song forever be my only boast is you hallelujah all I have is Christ hallelujah Jesus is my <laughs> we never thought we'd sing together that much so it's it's a good thing we need to do more of that <laughs> but that song just really washed over me one night as I was singing it because it, it made me begin to contemplate my, my own pride because I'm singing all I have is Christ over and over again and and I'm recognizing pride that I'm wrestling with in my heart and Jesus is just affirming over and over again you have nothing to boast in candy but in me and and ultimately that is all I have in life so that washed over me and then we sang it is well with my soul which is you know all-time wonderful beautiful song will never grow old and um, God I, I just wept the whole song pretty much like every time I tried to sing I just started to cry because I'm thinking about all the trials God has seen me through and you know my dad being sick and passing away losing Meredith Nana's dementia and just how easily it would have been to throw away your faith in times like that and God just held on to me he didn't let me go and I was overcome with the fact that God has not let me go and I'm his child and he loves me and he's still allowing me to persevere in my faith and so that that's a beautiful thing that music can do and this is what the psalmist here is saying contemplate the things that God has done for you and as you do that it will overflow into worship so um, the, ex the experience of God bringing his work in my life to the forefront of my mind made my experience of worship deeper and more meaningful um, the second scripture that <clears throat> 
that I want to reiterate the point that authentic worship can't be created, but is an overflow of a heart that loves God comes from Colossians. If you want to turn to Colossians chapter 3, I've got my little note in here. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16, which is a common verse you go to when you're thinking about worship. Um, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Before when I read this verse, I focused mainly on the command to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. But I looked at this with fresh eyes and I realized I can't sing the songs and hymns and psalms until we go back to the beginning here where it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That is where it begins. The word of God has to dwell in us so that we will want to sing and so that we can sing out of the overflow of that word that's in our heart. Um, I went to a breakout session where this was highlighted. He said, you will only be able to develop a culture that reflects this verse in as much as your own heart reflects this verse. We must first love God we must see and savor the glory of Christ if we want others to love God and savor Christ. The quality of the passion of our gatherings will be marked by our personal passion and devotion to God's word. And that was some convicting stuff <laughs> for me to hear as I reflect on my own heart and my lack of consistency in God's word. Because how am I to ever supposed to help lead anything, encourage others if I'm not doing it myself on a regular basis. So just want to encourage us all to be in God's word on a regular basis. Feed your soul so that it will overflow. Um, the second part of the verse says teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. We have a responsibility to teach and admonish with the words that we're singing to each other. It's not just, the teaching doesn't just come from the pulpit. The teaching comes from what we sing. There are non-believers here most likely today. We want them to hear truth from God's word. And they can hear it in our preaching and they can hear it in our singing. Our children need to hear it in what we sing. Um, let's see. For those of you who don't enjoy singing itself, it's okay. Join in and allow your heart, heart to rejoice with the words. Bathe your heart in the gospel truth that you're hearing. Rejoice in the theology that is being sung. Don't waste the time of singing just because you don't have a voice that you think is good. You can still learn from what you're hearing. A speaker said it best when he said, The Lord is not listening to the excellence of our voice. He's listening for our heart's devotion. Let us commit our hearts to growing in devotion to Christ. The second point that God really impressed upon me at the conference was the urgency to train the next generation to love singing. I want to encourage families to sing together at home and together in the worship service. Singing seals truth in our hearts and in our minds. It communicates theology and truth about God to all the generations who are in worship. One pastor's statement really hit home for me. He said, we must not fail to get right what Disney clearly understands, that we must sing into our children's ears what we want in their hearts. Think about that. We must sing into our children's ears what we want in their hearts. That is convicting, isn't it? Disney understands that our children embrace what they hear over and over and over. What do our children hear in our worship services? What do they see? Do they see our devotion and our passion, our love for God's word, or is the entertainment industry winning the battle? That was definitely something that Steve and I had to evaluate as parents. There was so much information on this topic, but a few statements that stuck out to me in regards to children and singing were, uh, what songs do we want our congregation to grow old with? 
that really got me thinking. You know, what do I want my great-grandchildren to be singing here in Piney Grove many generations to come? What songs will our younger generations hold on to in the dark times of, of their future? I think about my Nana, who even in the worst of her dementia could sing hymns and songs that she taught to her Sunday school kids. She would sing them to my babies. And um, these songs communicated gospel truth that I pray her soul could find rest in even when her mind was so confused. What songs do we want to equip our children with to sing through their future battles? How are we teaching children and students? Your choir, your choir 20 years from now is sitting in your five-year-old Sunday school class. Invest in those children now to bear fruit in the future. That was a little bit overwhelming because <laughs> I'm just like, I teach the two and three year olds. You know, I do a lot with the kids, obviously, and I, I feel so ill equipped other than I can sing to them, but I, they need to learn how to read music. They need to understand musical terminology. There's just so much. So if, if you have a child who's interested in music, encourage that talent. You never know, you might be raising the next worship leader at our church or beyond. So just encourage musical interest for, for the future's sake. And finally, I just want to thank Larry and Jason for their emphasis on leading musical worship um, and teaching about the importance of music. Uh, one speaker said that the biggest common denominator in churches who sing well is a pastor who cares about musical worship. And I can definitely say that you two care. So thank you. And I want to thank all of our singers, our instrumentalists, our choir, our praise team, everybody who sacrificially lead us every week. Um, I sat in a session about leading small congregations in worship and heard many stories of congregations who had 50 people or less. They didn't have any instrumentalists. They didn't have a choir or a praise band. Um, and I just realized how blessed we really are here to have so many gifted musicians and singers. Um, and I just, I wanna thank all of you. Um, these are just a few thoughts that I wanted to share with you today, but the list could go on and on and Stephen is gonna come up in, a, in just a minute. It was just such a fr fruitful few days for us and we gleaned so much wisdom from it. I hope that this encourages you to contemplate the benefits of God in your life and allow your praise and gratitude to overflow into personal worship and ultimately build our passion for worship here at Piney Grove. So Stephen's gonna come up. <clears throat> Thank you, Candy. <laughs> so, as, as she said, there are a lot of things that we, uh, we learned. Um, a lot of information to try to squeeze into this time frame. Um, you know, if we could have, we would have taken everyone and with us and put you in a room of 7,000 people and sing songs to the Lord. Um, Otherwise, it's hard to describe what it was like, what it felt like. Um, and we, we reflected on this afterward that, you know, besides coming home to our, our wonderful family and children, we could, have, we could have gone to that every day and sang every day and done that. And a picture of what heaven may be like. If it is, it'll be exciting. There are a couple things that I learned. And um, the first one was, what is worship? Um, when we think about worship, we use it all the time. We talk about the worship service. We talk about um, going to worship. And what does that mean? Well, worship is what happens in the heart um, and involves the emotions of our inner being, who we are. Sometimes it's emotions like joy and rejoicing and praise, but it's even sorrow or conviction those things also lead us to worship. Let's take rejoicing as, as an example. Psalm 13.5 says, But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Psalm 118.24 says, this is, the Lord, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. 
Matthew 5, 11, 12 says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Romans 12, 14, 15 says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And Philippians 4, 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. It's a command. It's not an option. But how, how do we rejoice? What is it that leads to rejoicing? Rejoicing cannot be done without hearts, the heart's emotion expressed. That's how we rejoice. But you've got to ask yourself the question, what is, what is your affection on? What is it that gets our affection, our heart's affection, that leads us to rejoicing? Let's turn to Philippians 1, 19 through 26. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. We're going to spend just a minute looking at this topic. Philippians chapter 1, 19 through 26. Paul says, Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now and as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For I am to live in the flesh, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you, with you all, for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glorify in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. So Paul says that ultimately he would rather die and be with Christ. To him, he says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. John Piper is um, one of Candy's certainly best speakers, and he's probably mine now, um, because he said something at the conference that was probably to me the most important thing said. He said this, he said, the inner essence of worship is experiencing Christ as a more satisfying treasure than everything you lose in death and everything you have in life. Said another way, everything that death can take and life can give. So what, is, what does that mean? That means that everything you have, everything you lose when you die, the people you love, the things you have, the home you have, the job you have, everything you lose in death or have now that you live and have those things, they're all gone. And even now, compared to Jesus, they're nothing. Paul says, I would rather that I die this moment and spend eternity with Jesus. I love my children. I love my wife. I love my job as a physician. But compared to Jesus, He is a billion times better. And if I had him over them, I would choose him. Jesus said it this way, Matthew 10, 34 to 39. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That is the comparison. 
Jesus is all, as we sing. Is Christ our greatest treasure? All satisfying, all sufficient. Is he our heart's desire? All satisfying, all sufficient. Do we believe that? I have to ask myself that question. I don't always know that I do. Do I believe that? Charles Spurgeon, who, who I love, uh, a great brother in the faith, one of my heroes said it this way, which I love, my, probably my favorite quote. If Christ is not all to you, he is nothing to you. He will never go into partnership as a part savior of men. If he, if he be something, he must be everything. And if he is not everything, he is nothing to you. Is he your everything? Colossians 3, 1 through 4 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. The idea here is that you have died. When Stephen Manning gave his life to Christ because of the work he did through the Spirit of my life, and I said, yes, I believe, I died. I died. I no longer existed. And Jesus lives for me. He is my life. All that I am, all that I have is for His glory. It is Him. Romans 6, 1 through 4 says, says it this way. What shall we say then? Are we, to, are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You died, were buried with Him in the grave, baptized into His death, and raised to newness of life in Him. This is regeneration. We were talking to our children about what regeneration is. And of course, as you can imagine, they were like, what is that? And it is being brought from death to life. Death to life. And if it doesn't bring it home, then remember this. If you're a human being and you are born, you're just like me. I deserve hell. I am sinful, I am malicious, I am evil. We all are. Scripture makes this very clear. Romans 1, Romans 3, throughout Scripture. There is no one good, not one righteous. So, so when, you ref, when you reflect on that reality, and then you think what Jesus has done for you, that's regeneration. You were dead, and now you are alive. Death to life. That is what leads to worship. If we're not experiencing that inner essence by savoring the supremacy of Christ above all things, all things, in our hearts, then there is no worship. You may, it may be singing, it may be saying things, but it is not worship. Our singing and our preaching should always come from, the, from that essence, that worship to our Lord. The second thing that I really learned was that singing, singing is worship, singing as worship. Um, this involves using music and the words of our mouth to express God's biblical truth, the rich theology, the sound doctrine. You know, we talk about doctrine and you may think, oh man, I don't know what that is. Well, it, it's very simple. And this is something that I've come up with as I've thought through it. Not to brag by any means, but just to show you it is really simple. It is number one, doctrine is number one, what you should believe and why you should believe it. 
But it's also number two, what you should not believe and why you should not believe it. That leads to good doctrine. This is what doctrine is. This is how we get doctrine. Theology, our understanding of who God is. We sing in our homes, in our churches, our meetings together on Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night, small groups. Um, we sing out of that rich understanding of God's truth. Here are a few things that I learned about singing as worship. I learned that I need to be leading worship in my home. That singing and worship in the church for my family should start and be an overflow of our singing and worship at home. That's where it starts. Uh, one of the things that we've done, and we've, we've worked on this, is learning a hymn a month. Um, and I'm going to actually ask the kids to come up, because we're going to sing this for you. Just to, just to give you an example of what this may look like. It can be different in your home. You can do it lots of different ways. We usually do a, a devotion, and uh, during that time, we'll, we'll sing a song. And we're going to make that our hymn of the month and move on to another good hymn. The Gettys produced a really good kids' hymnal that has simplified words, and we're going to put the words on the screen for you. And I'm sure most of you know this. This is um, I Stand in All, um, also called How Marvelous. This so. is just our first hymn that we're working yes, on. Yes, the so. first one. We don't have a huge track record yet, but... <laughs> we're getting there. All right, ready? Oh, yes. How marvelous, how wonderful in my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Thank you. Thank you, guys. The other thing I learned was that I learned that hymns are an incredible resource of solid theology. Um, I'll be honest, growing up, I didn't really think that hymns were the coolest thing. Uh, and I, want, I was so looking forward to contemporary worship, and I've, I've seen my life come full circle. And I've realized, and the Gettys have helped with this tremendously, is that you can actually bridge clear biblical lyrics with contemporary style and instruments. And it's, it's a wonderful combination. Hymns are chocked full of just rich, purposeful words. Every single word is purposeful. We also looked at singing um, the song of the, book, song of the Bible, the Psalms. Um, and they, they can help us rejoice in God's truth. I learned that singing is done in worship out of the treasuring of Christ in my heart. As emotion erupts in praise for all that God has done for me and who He is. The song, All I Have in, is Christ. It really resounds as we sang earlier. Singing with 7,000 other people, with voices and hands raised high. There's nothing like it. The interesting thing, and I found this, I didn't think about this until about a, a couple weeks after we, we come back. Not once did I remember ever being distracted by other thoughts, what I'm going to do next, I found myself glued to each word as we read it on the screen and sang it as a loud proclamation of my heart to worship to my King. So, in conclusion, as you, as you know, uh, we are in the process of moving into one combined service. And I want to simply encourage us that as we work with Larry, our shepherd, in bridging to that one combined service, 
May our focus be simply on worshiping Jesus, our all-satisfying, all-sufficient Savior and treasure. Everything else will fall into place just fine. All the details, the exact time of worship, the exact style of music, the time we meet are all secondary to Him and are done from a heart that is fully savoring Jesus. That is my prayer. And I pray that we all treasure Christ more than anything. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we can bring how we experienced your work in our hearts and our life through this conference to these people today. And I pray you would use it. I pray you would, Lord, through your Spirit, help us to savor you, to find Jesus as our all-sufficient treasure, that He is all we need. May we worship from that heart. May our emotions erupt with love for you. As the parable Jesus spoke of says that for joy the man went and bought the field to buy the treasure. For joy. May that be our heart. May we sing, may we worship out of the joy that you give us because of all you've done. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you guys for sharing with us and leading us this morning to contemplate true worship and the true tre treasure of our worship is indeed Christ. I'll ask if you will, if you'll stand to your feet. As, um, as they led us this morning, uh, well, as their family led uh, in how marvelous I stand amazed, I'm going to ask that we dismiss uh, on, this, on this song and sing this together, uh, if you will. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Amen. Thank you guys again for sharing.